Hello, everyone. In this podcast, we will be discussing sensitive topics such as sexual assault. It's important to take care of yourself while listening. Some suggestions are listening while you're in a healthy headspace or knowing who you can reach out to if you become upset. Our 24-7 helpline for crisis calls based out of Central Florida is 407-500-HEAL. By contacting the national hotline at 1-800-656-4673, you can get support and learn about your local resources. There's always someone ready to help. Center podcast. Here we sit down with professionals that serve survivors and victims of trauma or those who have experienced violence and have conversations about social issues. This week, we are talking about mental health resources. My name is Emily Mitchell, and I am the education coordinator at the Victim Service Center. With me today, I have Faith Burns. Faith uses she, her pronouns and has worked as one of the program coordinators for the Mental Health Association of Central Florida since September 2019. As of March 2020, Faith also runs MHACF's live web series known as Coping Together, where her team brings on professionals in the mental health field to discuss topics relative to COVID-19 and to provide wellness tools and coping strategies to their viewers in regards to mental health. She is currently pursuing a master's in clinical psychology at the University of Central Florida, is fluent in English and Spanish, and strives to become a bilingual therapist specializing in trauma and grief counseling. Faith, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. That was always really fun to hear myself introduced. So thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and an honor getting to be on your show. Thank you so much. And I also have Mary McGee. Mary uses she, her pronouns and graduated from University of Central Florida with a Bachelor of Science degree in psychology. Since 2017, she has been the social media coordinator for Mental Health Association of Central Florida. She strives to advocate for those who have experienced mental health challenges and trauma by eradicating the stigma surrounding mental health. So Mary, thank you as well for being here today. Hey, of course. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you both. Mm-hmm. And as a really brief introduction, the Victim Service Center works in tandem with many partners in the community who are also servicing victims and those who need assistance. One of those partners is the Mental Health Association with Central Florida. Uh, Essentially, their mission is to provide mental health services, support, and information to the members of our Central Florida community. So what we are looking to explore in this episode is what mental health resources are out there, what are some stigmas surrounding mental health, as well as barriers that those who suffer from mental illness face, and how can we support a loved one? So with that in mind, my first question is, and, and anyone can jump in at any time, mental health can be a complicated term. So would you be able to break it down and share what mental health means to you? Yeah, um, so I can start with that. And I think Mary also, um, one of the things that I love about mental health is that it's very individualized. So I think, like you said, it's a complicated term. Therefore, I think that everyone has their own um, official definition of what it is to them. So for me, uh, it's very much the concept that how you feel and your emotions are just as important as your physical health. So just like you need to exercise and eat right to be physically healthy, you also need to practice, you know, good um, practices for mental and you know psychological well-being. So kind of adding to that, if someone is ill physically, you know, you get treatment, you go to the doctor, you get medication. Um, it's a very similar thing for mental health, and I think that that's something that you know, just in the last couple of months with coronavirus, we've really seen it start to take even more of a prominence 
um, and be considered prevalent in society because people are seeing that it really does have long-term effects and your mental health is um, integral to who you are as a person. And again, um, like I said, the biggest thing for me is that mental health is, it's very unique. Everybody, even if you have the same diagnosis as the person sitting next to you, even if you don't have a diagnosis, you still you know, go through symptoms of mental health struggles. Everybody is going through that right now with coronavirus, whether it's stress, anxiety, fear. Um, so that for me, in a nutshell, is kind of what mental health means to me. But I know Mary has her own term mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, of course. So that was a really like intricate and just really well said definition of mental health. I kind of almost want to take that a little bit further just by saying that just as everyone has physical health, everyone also has mental health. You don't need to even have a diagnosed condition to have mental or physical health. Just by existing, just the state of being, we have those things. Um, and treating your brain just the same as any organ in your body, that when it is in need of care or attention, whether it's hurting or not functioning properly, um, you can take care of it and that kind of that knowledge at least when I heard that for the first time I was like oh wow like that really changed things and like changed my perspective of what mental health was about and it really gives you the permission to take care of yourself by taking away that stigma I yeah. love that. I think mm -hmm. that's a wonderful way of describing it. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. And we'll get more into it later, I believe, with surrounding the stigmas. But it's really interesting that we don't treat it as, you know, another part of our body when mm -hmm. it comes to mental health. And I think it's really important to highlight that. I really appreciate you both sharing that. With that in mind, you know, um, thank you so much for all the amazing work that you do with the, the Mental Health Association of Central Florida. It is such important work. And that being said, can you share with our audience, you know, what MHA does and a little bit about your roles there? Sure. Um, I'll start that one off. Um, I'll just I'll go into a little bit of the history. We've been around since 1946. So like quite a while. Um, probably, this is, you know, I'm not 100% certain of this, we're one of the earliest um, associations, organizations in Central Florida that's dedicated specifically to mental health. Um, and we have, you know, we've changed kind of shapes a lot over the decades. Um, but right now, we have several programs that serve our community. So one of our first ones is that we have a, um, a peer recovery community called Reflections. And within Reflections, they offer several different support groups for different populations, different needs. Um, we do trainings and workshops, educational events, and some of all of these are free. Um, some of our workshops are our um, mental health first aid training. Um, we do a QPR training. We also do a um, an introduction to rap workshop. Um, we also have a plethora of support groups. Um, and these include our People Inc. support group, which is for individuals with schizophrenia. And it's also, it's been going on for like decades now. And the same, it's actually, it's one of my favorites because the same people go every single Monday that have been going now for years and years and years. Um, and so now they're like a little family. Um, we have a remote depression and anxiety support group that happens every Monday through Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. A sexual trauma support group, a suicide support group for people that are experiencing suicidal ideation. And we also have, as I mentioned, we have some educational events um, specifically, one of my favorites is our Reflections of Trauma event, where one of our um, one of our counselors we work with, his name is Dr. David Cavallari. He goes in and he talks about how instances of trauma change the brain, and how we can how using that information we can learn to cope effectively. And then, so going after. Reflections, we also have our Guardian Advocate Program, 
wherein trained volunteers um, are granted temporary guardianship over someone who has been Baker Acted. And so they go and they kind of advocate for the best interest of the client and they work with the staff at the behavioral hospital to kind of develop a, um, a treatment plan. We also have an Outlook clinic and our Outlook clinic is a free clinic that is run in partnership with Advent Health and it's for anyone that's over the age of 18, living in Orange County, uninsured, with a mental health challenge and a co-occurring medical condition. So Faith, I don't know if you wanted to go and talk about which ones you're involved with. Uh, absolutely, and Mary, thank you for starting out and really giving a good explanation of so many of the programs that MHACF has to offer. And I, I do wanna add to what you were saying and just that, you know, I, I think one of my favorite aspects of working with the Mental Health Association is that um, similar to the mental health field in general, we're always wanting to advance and further the ways that we can reach people. And that kind of leads into a lot of what I do, um, which were some of the newer programs created by the Mental Health Association. Um, so I believe the first one was, Mary, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was created in about 2009, um, which is our Mental Health Connections program. And so mm. With the growing sense of the internet, you know, in the 2000s and when the um, economic crash happened in about 2008, one of the things that was noticed was that a lot of people were needing mental health resources. People were struggling financially, all these different things. And the internet is a little overwhelming when you try to find um, resources for yourself at times. And so Mental Health Association um, was able to move a system from being paper to being electronic and actually helping get people connected with different mental health resources. Um, and there's an addition to that, which is that we actually bring on uh, college students who are receiving their undergraduate degree, usually in psychology or some kind of health services um, who are interested in this kind of field. And they actually, um, we talk with the clients and we try to figure out, you know, what are they looking for? So we take into account all kinds of things, the situation they're in, whether they have insurance, you know, if they have a previous diagnosis, and then based on distance and a bunch of other factors, we try to find a good match for what that person is looking for. And being in Florida, where I think we all know there's not as much mental health funding by the state as much as there are in other mm -hmm. states, um, I think that that adds to how hard our team works. And so the Connections program is run by myself and my partner, Alan Bruns. Um, and I am so thankful to Alan because he actually trained me when I was an intern. Um, but it's just really great to work with people that like Alan and like Mary and like so many of our staff who just all have the right mindset of going into this field. You know, we're not looking at people like they're a number. Um, every client that calls us, a lot of times they're coming to us and they haven't had a great experience with mental health. Maybe they've been just, you know, playing the phone tag game and just being mm -hmm. shuffled around to different centers, different you know, voicemail systems. And so by the time they get to us, they're pretty exasperated. And that is so defeating for someone who's trying to find help for themselves or someone they love. And they're almost constantly being told no. So the Connections program works to take the legwork out of that, to say to the person, you know, you matter, what you're looking for matters. And while we can't guarantee 100%, we can find exactly what you need or want, we can guarantee that we're going to give it 110%. And that's what I say to every caller I talk to. Um, and that I really love the aspect of having the undergraduate college students work with us because they actually go into our database and then they do the research. So they further their understanding of what services exist in the mental health field. They get, um, because of coronavirus, it's a little bit more limited, but usually they get quite, um, a, quite an experience of interacting with clients in this capacity where they have to, you know, be understand that it's about listening, understand that it's about hearing what that person wants, not necessarily what you think a person needs. Um, and then taking that and hearing their, hearing their interests, hearing their desire, what they need in a situation and applying that to looking for something in the system for them. And because of Google and the internet, we're always adding more. So our database has about 2,500 plus providers in the central Florida and extending areas. Um, and we're always adding to that. And so that is a lot about what Connections is. And like Mary said, that is a lot of what I do. So I apologize if I'm just going on and on about it. Um, <laughs> but the other aspect that we do, and this again is where I say 
the Mental Health Association is always trying to expand and advance itself. And so in a world where, you know, COVID really hit and social media became the primary form of connection um, within the community, we suddenly were looking at, you know, being remote in a system where we'd always Mm -hmm. been in the office for years. Yep. And so our team, uh, we came up with a question and that was, what can we do right now to reach people? You know, what can we do to make people feel connected, to make people feel informed in a world where everyone is so stressed and nervous and none of us know the right answer. None of us know exactly what's going to happen, but what we can do, and this is where I had an idea and I went to Mary and Mary is, and there, you know, a lot of my team, um, I, this project wouldn't exist without them. But I came up with this idea and I said, what about if we bring on, you know, mental health professionals in the area and we bring them onto a show and we talk about relevant topics to mental health and, you know, tie that into COVID and really talk to people about how they can cope and get through this time right now and not feel so alone while at the same time educating and informing ourselves. Um, Because I think that one thing that is really great about the mental health field is that all of us usually are wanting to learn more, wanting to expand our knowledge. And we're not afraid to say, I don't know about this. I want to learn more about it. Um, And so that is where the idea of coping together comes from. And so that um, started up in about March of 2020 when we really came up with the idea. And thanks to Mary and her hard work, she really helped us get it off the ground. Um, Alan also, and, you know, I, we really try to give credit to all of our team members. Um, but we now are looking at, I think we've done 30 episodes or so since April, um, coming out of it, we do two episodes a week and we talk about everything, um, really centered within four categories, which is trauma, grief, anxiety, and depression, um, and tying that into COVID-19. And unfortunately, you know, anything you talk about can really be tied into COVID right now because that is our reality. And even after there's a vaccine, it's post COVID. That's still going to be our reality for quite a while. Um, And that's really a lot of what coping together is. And so it was an honor to bring you on our show, Emily, and have Mm -hmm. Shannon on as well and getting to learn more about the programs. And that's a lot of what coping together is. It's bringing organizations, companies, professionals in the area onto our show and not just educating ourselves and the public on a topic, it's also mutually benefiting those, you know, around us. We want people to know what the Victim Service Center is. We want people to know, you know, who is a good person in the area that specializes in trauma. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we talk about on the show. So that is, in a nutshell, what Coping Together is. Awesome. Thank you so much. That, that really, it was a pleasure to be on your show, I think, uh, I think it's a great way to still stay connected, especially during this this tough time. Um, where can people find Coping Together? Well, I can answer that question. Um, Coping Together streams exclusively on our Facebook. And so you can find us either by going into the address bar and, you know, going to facebook.com slash M-H-A-C-F for Mental Health Association of Central Florida, or you can just search Mental Health Association of Central Florida while you're on Facebook and you'll find us. And it streams every Monday and Friday from um, about 1.30 to two, about. Awesome, yeah. okay, awesome. And I have a few different um, follow-up questions mm-hmm. uh, just to kind of go through that. So first off, you mentioned a couple of acronyms, QPR training, and I believe that's mm-hmm. for suicide prevention. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you'd like to bring up about that? So my area of interest in a career is actually trauma counseling and grief counseling. And I really eventually would like to do it regarding um, suicide and people who've lost a loved one to suicide. So I get really excited when I have opportunities to learn and talk about that. And that is a big part of what QPR training is. So Um, QPR training, essentially, we have a local professional who comes in. Um, It used to be in person, now it's virtual. But essentially, the idea is to, um, it stands for question, persuade, and refer. So it's the process of understanding how to approach someone when Mm -hmm. you are, you know, might be concerned that they might be having thoughts of suicide. So it serves two purposes, in my opinion. One is obviously to educate Um, and help you feel prepared to do so, especially we have our interns take part in it um, before they start the internship because we occasionally do get crisis calls. We do have to um, have people end up being Baker Acted, which, you know, involuntarily hospitalized for their own safety. Um, 
And the other part of that is also, I like to believe, you know, kind of debunking a lot of the misconceptions associated with suicide. Um, like the concept of if, you know, someone says, if someone, if you ask someone, are you, you know, are you feeling, mm-hmm. are you thinking about suicide? Or are you suicidal? You're planting the idea in their head. And that's not the case. And that's a lot of what QPR mm-hmm. goes into. Um, mm-hmm. And then the other one I think you're probably going to ask about is rap. Yep. And I would defer right. Mary mm-hmm. for that one. Okay. So RAP, it's basically, it's a two-day workshop. Um, what it is, is you'll go in, there's two facilitators typically, and it is all about creating a plan to kind of maintain your everyday mental health and to put in and formulate an action plan for when, for when it's possible that you're not feeling your best. So RAP stands for Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And so you can create a list of who your supports are, what coping methods work best for you. Then it could even get into as specific as if you're not doing your best, if you're in crisis, where to go, where you would like to go if um, if you have to, if you're going to be Baker acted, or if you if you're going to be checked into a behavioral hospital. And you can even get that notarized and it become um, a binding document. And so this is really, it's giving some power back to people when uh, they're kind of in a powerless situation or they feel powerless. Um, It makes it, you make the whole experience kind of feel a little bit more human. Um, And it's just even went before that crisis stage, um, using it to maintain your mental health I have a list of things that I that are part of my wrap that I do every single day in order to make sure that I'm doing my best. And so it's just I I recommend everyone to take it. You don't even have to, you know, be currently feeling these things. What you do have to do is you have to have um, you have to be a peer. So you have to have lived experience with a mental health challenge and you have to be living a recovery based lifestyle for two years. Okay, got it. And when you say like recovery based, does that mean that maybe you had a severe depressive episode and now you're kind of getting more into a healing? Yes. So yeah. So two years into your healing journey, whatever that looks like. Understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. It sounds almost like you're developing your own safety plan. You know, when we talk about domestic violence, Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about okay, pack, have a bag packed with essentials, know who you would be reaching out to, that kind of thing. So it almost sounds like a mental health safety plan, which I think is is a wonderful way, uh, a wonderful thing. So you said um, to take it. So uh, that kind of leads to my other question. Mm -hmm. Um, All of the services at Mental Health Association of Central Florida, are they free for the public or? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And what if someone calls and they're not from Central Florida, uh, would they still be able to connect and maybe you can refer them outside just in case? So working with the Connections Program, that does happen. We're in a different world right now with COVID-19 because a lot of things are virtual. So in regards to, um, I know for our support groups, Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter what state you're in, you're welcome to join anything. For our trainings, I'm not actually 100% sure on that. Mary, do you know? That I'm not sure of, but I do know I got word from um, one of our facilitators of our support groups, and they were saying that they had several people in the group that were from like New York, Pennsylvania, yeah. New Jersey that were that had participated. So right now, all of our support groups are free for anyone since they're online, they're accessible for anyone to attend. Um, but yeah, I'm that. Um, about our trainings that I'm not 100% sure about. But I will add and say that um, from the connections point, connections program point of view, if someone does call and they're looking for services, and it happens to me occasionally, um, I'll start a referral with them and they'll mention, you know, oh, I live in California or oh, I'm in, you know, Ohio. Um, Mental Health Association is part of a national branch. um, So there Mm -hmm. are different, um, they're all a little bit different in their own way, but there are various branches across the nation. Um, so we will try to find some that are, you know, a little bit 
um, closer mm -hmm. where that person is. So like find something in Texas if they're in Texas. Um, yeah. There are even a couple different ones within Florida itself. Um, so we do try to get people connected to mm -hmm. other options. Um, and if there's not a mental health association, one of the things I love about um, my interns and the program itself is that we don't just say, oh, we don't do that by we will try to say, OK, well, you know, we unfortunately are located in Florida, but let me, you know, go on Google and see if I can find mm -hmm. anything in your area. And we will find um, into the best of our ability. We'll look and see if there's a list of different options in whatever state that person's in and try to give that to them because we do want them to know that, you know, they matter. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are also, you know, the different nationwide options. Um, such as the suicide hotline and things like that, that people can always call. And so we do refer those as well. Awesome. And do you have a 24 hour helpline or a hotline that people can call? So we don't actually have a 24 hour hotline for situations like that. Um, I think typically we would refer people to 211. Would you agree with that, Faith? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, just because, so we're a, um, a small local nonprofit. Um, we are open nine to five Monday through Friday. Um, but one of the things that we're able to do, I think, um, with being in Central Florida is make, a, similar to coping together, make a lot of connections with different mm -hmm. organizations because we're all in it for the same reason. Um, and where we don't necessarily have the staff or the manpower to be there on the weekends or 24 seven, um, 211 is a resource that exists um, and we will refer people um, to them if we need to. Awesome, yeah, 211 is a wonderful resource. Basically at any time you could call mm -hmm. and whatever you're looking for for resources, they can connect you. Um, so definitely recommend 211. And, and that's exactly essentially what's important is that partners are working together in the community to support mm -hmm. each other, just like Mental Health Association is working with Victim Service Center and vice versa. Uh, last thing, I know it's kind of we're staying on this question for a long time, but the okay. Baker Act, um, this is something that I wasn't aware of until I moved to Florida. It wasn't something that I understood. Mm -hmm. Is um, Could someone just give us a brief briefing? I know it's involuntary hospitalization, but kind mm -hmm. of um, exactly what, we mean by have you been Baker acted or what is that exactly? So when someone is Baker acted, it's when they are seen as posing a danger either to themselves or to somebody else. And what happens is you will be involuntarily committed into a behavioral facility for 72 hours and you'll be assessed and either you can be discharged, you can move to a voluntary um, status. I can add to that. So yeah, yeah, so just to do a real quick overview. So the Florida Baker Act, um, essentially, it's like the, it also is known as the um, Florida mm -hmm. Mental Health Act. Basically, yeah. a person can either involve can be involuntarily, you know, checked in or admitted to a hospital. Um, they can also voluntarily be Baker Acted. Essentially, what it is, is it's like saying, when you're hurt, you go to the ER and you say, hey, you know, I need this checked out. It's kind of like going in and saying, hey, I need my brain checked out. Um, if you're voluntarily going in, you're aware that something is going on, whether you feel um, at risk of hurting yourself or like you feel like you want to hurt somebody else. It's a place where you can go in and they will um, essentially place you on a 72 hour hold. If you're in voluntary status, you can pretty much leave um, at any time. From what I understand, if you're in voluntary status, what that means is that um, to some extent, either someone you love or someone around you identified that you were a risk to yourself or others. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. they called 911, and 911 sent out an officer, um, usually and hopefully it is a CIT, crisis intervention trained officer, um, who is trained and familiar with the process of a mental health crisis. They will perform a wellness check and see if that person is indeed um, posing a risk to themselves or others. If they determine that is the case, um, they will take them to the nearest hospital. Uh, voluntary Baker actually you can go to whatever hospital you want. Involuntary, they are, I believe, state mandated to go to the nearest hospital. If you're involuntarily Baker acted, you're then placed on a 72 hour hold. Um, that is not breakable. You are evaluated during those hours. Um, that does start, it's considered like three business days. So if you're checked in on a Saturday, mm -hmm. that hold doesn't actually start. That evaluation period doesn't start till Monday. Um, once those three days are up, uh, if you are involuntarily Baker acted, what might happen is you end up having to go to a court case. That court case is um, within the hospital and it is a doctor, a, essentially like a judge, 
um, the psychiatrist and the patient. The patient or the client is in a state where they have not been, they've, it's been determined that they're not in a state stable enough to make their own decisions for their best interest. So usually that's when a loved one steps in and will represent that patient's rights and interests. If let's say the family's out of state, they're not able to make it, um, or maybe the, pa the family's done it so many times and they just don't wanna do it this time, uh, one thing that Mental Health Association provides is um, guardian advocates are volunteers um, that are trained in a um, afternoon training session. They then go through an interview process, but they are determined to be able to advocate for that person in court. So they don't, um, they go in and they actually will take what the client wants, what the client's interests are, what the client's best interests are, and, you know, voice that essentially to the court. And that is used to make a lot of the decisions. If that person is then taken to um, consider that they need to further hospitalization, further treatment, um, that guardian advocate then checks in with the patient frequently um, for the remainder of their duration until they either are um, released or they um, are turned into a voluntary status, you know, if, that, if they get to that point. Um, so essentially the guardian advocate is there to monitor the patient, the client, make sure that they're not being abused. Um, also make sure that they're being heard. Um, and when it comes to medication, things like that, they might have to then, you know, um, be the person to consent for those medications. But all the time, it's not about what the guardian advocate thinks is best, it's what the client wants. You're being a voice to that client. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for breaking that down. That was yeah. something that I, I wasn't aware of until I actually moved down here. So I wanted to highlight that. So I really appreciate uh, mm -hmm. your very extensive answer on that. Yeah, sorry um, it was so long. <laughs> no, no, it's perfect. It's really, really important to break that down so that people understand that, that it's something that happens. Um, we went over a little bit about how your role has changed a little bit under COVID. You did mention that you you a lot of social media mm -hmm. is really the way to connect with people. And, you know, mm -hmm. with I, I found it really interesting that you also talked about the 2008 crash. And I'm kind of equating that a little bit with COVID in, in the sense that, you know, mm -hmm. there's going to be increased stress and anxiety surrounding all of us during this pandemic. And I can imagine, you know, that MHA has seen some changes and trends regarding people's mental health. So I was wondering if you could expand more on things that have been impacted by COVID-19 and a little bit about your roles, but also if you have any trends that you've seen as far as mental health that you wanted to share. So I know for sure, since I actually, um, this is something that I've heard from the Reflections director. Um, what she has said is that through her support groups, yeah, people are really responding to these online um, anxiety and depression support groups. And so people are really coming on because they've all said that they really need this because our support group isn't even for people that are formally diagnosed with depression or an anxiety disorder. It's for anyone that's feeling feelings of depression or anxiety. And people are feeling that right now. This is a time where a lot of people have you know, job uncertainty or have lost their jobs, are trying to get unemployment. Um, they don't know what's going to happen with their housing. This is a really uncertain and stressful time. And this is a place where people can go for free and it's accessible. Um, and it's where they can just share their experiences and their thoughts. It doesn't even have to be necessarily COVID related, um, but there's definitely been an uptick since then. Yeah. I don't know if you had, if you had witnessed anything through the Connections program, Faith. I'd say that um, even more so maybe than the Connections program, just from what I've heard and from articles that have come out, um, one big thing is that I know for a while when COVID first um, was really hitting, there was an uptick in um, suicides, but there was actually a plateau or even decrease in calls to the suicide hotlines and um, crisis centers. So what was happening was people were feeling like there was no hope and they weren't even interested in trying to get help. They felt mm -hmm. like all hope was gone. Um, I think that Central Florida really has worked hard to share that that is not the case and there are options for help. Um, our CEO worked hand in hand with you know the Orange County mayor, um, various professionals, um, influential people in the area 
to actually put out um, public service announcements in regards to suicide awareness and prevention. Um, from what I understand, that actually did help, and they are again seeing um, increases or you know return to similar levels of calls to suicide hotlines, calls for resources. Um, I've also seen personally seen an increase in just a lot of people struggling with depression, um, maybe to the point where they actually want to get help, uh, where previously people might have felt like you know they. Um, they didn't want they didn't want any help or something like that. People might be at the point now where they're more willing to accept help and want help. Um, those are my own personal views on it, though I don't have any statistics to back that up. That's just the um, opinion of someone who's worked in the field um, in this capacity. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. I I, I have heard similar echoes. Uh, on a lot of my other podcasts as well in regards to mental health kind of coming at the forefront during COVID. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it makes a lot of sense. So I just wanted to check in with you both about that since you both work at the Mental Health Association, which is really, really important always. But I think I'm really happy that this resource is still out there for people. And it's really, really important work that you do. That being said, you know, mental health has been talked more and more about in the media lately, I think with COVID, but also just in general. Um, and it's bringing a lot of awareness to this issue. And, it, and it's really important. That being said, do you think that there are still stigmas in regards to mental health? We went over them a little bit, but it, did you have any other stigmas you wanted to bring up? Yeah, absolutely. There, There's absolutely still stigmas surrounding mental health. I, I see it basically every day. There are, you know, these micro transgressions that I that I hear and that I witness. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but we still need to continue doing our work of advocacy and education to ensure that some of our most vulnerable communities are being protected um, from this misinformation, which fuels that stigma. Um, to be like, there's one particularly that really, I think is really important um, to kind of dispel because, um, to be cautious of like treading into political waters, there's a lot of conversation about mental health and mental health care that occurs only after tragedies that involve gun violence. And with um, those with mental health challenges, they are much more likely to be statistically likely to be victims of violence than the perpetrators. Um, suicide, for example, is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States, and murder doesn't even make that list. Um, equating those with mental health conditions um, with violence can perpetuates and contributes to the idea that people with mental health conditions are dangerous or and and scary. And this is something that kind of comes up yearly especially since, you know, we're creeping into fall, it's kind of Halloween time, we see a lot of things like costumes or movies around this time that kind of show people as, you know, with mental health conditions as scary or dangerous. Um, you know, they like, for example, like people in street jackets or, um, movies that take place in institutions. Um, yeah, it's it's something that's really, um, really damaging, directly damaging. To kind of add to that, Mary, I mm -hmm. definitely agree with you on um, the danger of perpetuating that stigma for the patients. But for me, another one that really bothers me genuinely is, um, like I'm a huge fan of shows like American Horror Story, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. when you portray things especially when it comes to mental health. And um, there's an entire season that takes place in like a mental health insane asylum in the fifties, I believe 1950s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people still believe that that is how um, institutions, you know, when someone is in a behavioral health center, like that they're going to be treated and as such. And so I think it's just about educating and informing people that that's actually not how it is. Um, like a big one. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with electroshock um, therapy, mm -hmm. but that was, you know, and I don't know if any of you ever read One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest uh, mm -hmm. by Ken Kesey, but I read it in high school and, you know, they portray it as this 
by and it, and it was in the past it was you know kind of an inhumane thing to do nowadays there's been so much progress with it so much advancement that it's actually a very effective tool um in certain situations and it's run you know it's overseen by a psychiatrist and it's you know it's a matter of seconds if minutes um it's very well structured nowadays and so people see things like one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, American Horror Story, mm -hmm. the scary movies, and they associate those psychiatric units with that. And that only further, I think, perpetuates people from being less likely to check themselves into the hospital if they're feeling, you know, like they mm -hmm. are feeling thoughts of suicide, because who would want to go into that environment willingly if that's what you've seen and you understand? So part of it is understanding that that's not how it is, um, you know, for people to understand that. But it's also at our jobs, I think, at working in the mental health field to educate that, advocate for that, that it's better to go to the hospital and you are going to be cared for in that regard. Um, and then I think the only other thing I was going to mention in terms of those stigmas is um, the I'm not here to speak for, you know, neither of us are here to speak for any population or represent a particular group we're here to build our knowledge and share facts associated with what is known about mental health. But for me, there are still a lot of misconceptions that exist with, you know, specific mental illnesses. Like Mary said, you know, there's um, the association of crazy and we don't want people to think that getting help for themselves is like admitting that they're crazy. It is a normal thing that you are feeling uh, feelings within yourself of sadness, of anger, of whatever it is. Um, you are valid in how you feel. And that is true with, depression, persistent mental illness, people view um, in the media that schizophrenia is an extremely dangerous diagnosis. And uh, from what I understand, the majority of clients with schizophrenia are nonviolent. Mm -hmm. um, and it's those stigmas they face that I think prevents a lot of them from getting the help that they, they do need. And it's the same with persistent mental illness. It is just a way of living. It's not something that has to be cured. It's not something that can be fixed. It's something that you live with. And it, you know, I think that's a lot of what um, I feel passionate about in the mental health field is understanding that it's about coping with what you have, whether it's depression, anxiety, OCD, or, you know, bipolar too. Um, so that I think really sums up how I feel about the stigmas that still exist in mental health. Would you add anything to that, Mary? Yeah, um, I mean, I could go on and on. Like, yeah, a we bunch both could. <laughs> of things popped up in my head, but I feel like it will unravel, and this whole podcast will just be about um, picking apart different things that I've seen in, like, particular the particularly popular culture and the media about how um, it's negatively portrayed. Um, but yeah, those your your thoughts really um, uh, succinctly summed it up. Yeah, thank you so much for breaking those down. I think it actually will make me lead to out of order into our questions a little bit because you mentioned a lot about barriers and how these stigmas, thinking of being afraid to seek help, being afraid to be another number or someone who perhaps, oh, if I have this, maybe that means I'm a violent person. And so not wanting to reach out and get support, those kinds of things. So because of that, I'm going to actually go out of order a little bit about um, what are some barriers and additional barriers that those who suffer from mental illness face when, you know, they're looking for help and how do organizations such as the Mental Health Association of Central Florida overcome those barriers? Yeah, to answer your um, question in regards to barriers, um, this is something that I am very proud to work with the Mental Health Association about because we do have those programs, you know, in addition to connections and getting people connected, we have the Reflections program. And that's not just about providing support and resources. It's also educating and advocating for mental health. So in terms of barriers, I think a big one for people, unfortunately, is finances, um, especially for psychiatric services. I think that's the biggest thing that I see um, working with the Mental Health Association that keeps people from getting help is the limitation of finances, particularly with psychiatric services. If someone is struggling with a persistent mental illness or they think they might have severe depression, um, there's a point where medication and therapy, you know, are important, but it you might need medication or benefit from medication to get to a point where you can really get somewhere in talk therapy. A big one also is distance. 
Although COVID has given us a new platform and opportunity to access treatment from further away, prior to it, um, there were hardly any psychiatrists that were virtual. There were hardly, there were, there were a few, but it wasn't as easy to access a counselor from a distance perspective. Um, so the good news about that is that I think that we are seeing, and go, even after COVID, we're going to see that barrier um, start to come down quite a bit. Uh, but a, another one, like we talked about, is I think the fear of judgment. If someone goes to get help, they're going to be marked as crazy. They're going to be marked as weak. Um, that's a big reason why um, I've done, I've talked about this on my show with a couple guests, but um, like first responders and police officers are, and military are built to be strong and help other people. And so therefore they don't want to be seen as weak. And that might be, you know, they're told to rub dirt on it. They're told to tough it out. This is how it is. You know, um, a guest of mine said that a really common phrase is like, stick it up, stick it out, buttercup. Like you have to get over it. Um, and that's a really dangerous thought process. And perpetuating that is going to lead those people to not really want to get help because they're going to be seen as weak. They're, maybe someone's going to take away their gun. Maybe someone's going to you know, fire them from their job and that's their livelihood. Um, and just in regards to like a men versus women standpoint, a gender um, difference, a lot of men similar to that, you know, first responder, police officer um, mentality, when they're kids, they're told to rub dirt on it. They're told, um, you know, boys don't cry. These different aspects, men are told to tough it out. And I think that that's a big reason why one of the highest rates of suicide we see is in um, like middle-aged men. More often than not, it is um, white middle-aged men, but there are still high rates um, across all, you know, cultural and racial identities within suicide. But I think a big reason for that is that men feel like they need to um, stick it out. They need to deal with it on their own. Boys are taught to handle things internally. Girls, it's okay to cry girls, it's okay to do this. Um, and so I think obviously there's, you know, there are um, clarifications in that that can be made and there are obviously extenuating circumstances, but overall um, men are faced with that mentality of they have to stick it out and deal with it on their own. And that can turn into internal pain. Um, and that's, you know, not dealing with that just makes it fester within you. Um, and then the last one I'd say is, um, maybe accessibility, things like that um, for people who are disabled. Um, there, you know, again, finances comes in the way of that, but also just, I think, um, having those options. And that is where Mental Health Association comes into play with trying to provide those services. Um, the support group we have called People's Inc., it works with um, clients who have schizophrenia. We do our online support groups to, you know, um, battle that barrier of distance educational events to help bring that um, awareness of stigma that exists and to help bring that down. Um, and then trainings to help people who are in the field um, to be further prepared to help their clients in a lot of ways. Um, or even just internally, you know, how do you train yourself to, um, if I'm worried about my friend who I might be suicidal, how do I talk to them about it? And so that is a big um, thing that I think MHA prides ourselves on is um, that we exist in a big way to overcome those barriers. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for breaking that down, Faith. And, and it kind of leads to my other question about are there specific populations or demographics more likely to experience mental health challenges or? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're in, again, to be cautious to like, not like to not speak on behalf of any certain community that you know, we are not a part of. Um, there's certainly, what comes to my mind is a lot of communities of color and also LGBTQ plus populations. Um, people of color are, you know, they experience racism in their everyday lives and as well as prejudice um, towards the LGBTQ community. And of course, those absolutely negatively impact mental health for these populations, and especially those who are at the intersection of these communities. Um, I have some statistics that um, I have written down here that people of color are at a higher risk for PTSD than their white counterparts. Um, repeated exposure to acts of racism can lead to depression, anxiety, and insomnia. And prejudice experienced by people in the LGBTQ community can contribute to 40% of transgender adults having reported making a suicide attempt. 
those who also identify as LGBTQ are more likely to develop depression, low self-esteem, eating disorders, anxiety, substance use disorders, self-harm, and suicidal ideation. And I think just one of the best things we can do in order to help these communities is that we can educate ourselves. If we take time to learn about the unique challenges each of these communities faces, then when we see misinformation being disseminated, we can speak out and change the conversation by informing others. Thank you so much for bringing mm -hmm. all that to light. It's very important to bring up, and it makes me think of when we talk about sexual violence, for example, we do have at-risk populations, and it makes sense that there would be at-risk populations depending on how they experience microaggressions and racism and, and different systemic issues and why that would be more at risk for certain mental health issues. So I really appreciate that. Not to perpetuate the idea that only certain populations experience certain mental mm -hmm. health, of course, mm -hmm. but it is important to highlight intersectionality at any point. I think we can always bring that up yeah. in, into the conversation. Um, with that being said, what are some nearby mental health resources that you would like our audience to be aware of? I know that another thing that the Mental Health Association does is connect people to these resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there are so many different organizations that are close by to the Mental Health Association or just in the Central Florida area. Um, but I'll just take time to highlight some of them that just do really amazing work. Um, NAMI, so a National Alliance of Mental Illness, Greater Orlando. They currently, they're offering free in-person and online support groups for both um, Recovery Connection and families. Um, there's another um, organization that I really love. Um, it's actually run by two of MHA's former employees called Peer Support Space. It is Central Florida's first peer-run mental health drop-in center. And coming soon, uh, we'll see when uh, it opens, but um, is the first mental health respite that's run by um, peer specialists. Individuals at the drop-in center will meet with a peer specialist. So a peer specialist is someone with lived experience of mental health challenges and has gone through training to help support others living with mental health challenges. Um, and so other things that they offer at this drop-in center, they can do, you know, they can socialize with others. There's yoga classes. They're going to be doing cooking classes. Um, there's gardening that they can do. You, there's just places where you can go and work on schoolwork. They do movie nights. Um, they also have a ton of free support groups for all different types of populations. Um, whether it's for a support group for those in the autism spectrum, for Asian individuals that are a part of the LGBTQ community, uh, new parents, mental health professionals, uh, LGBTQ women and trans individuals, um, writers, those with disabilities, like the list, it goes on. Um, so this is, and there's, I know that they also do um, daily calls twice a day. And I think they also do one on Saturday as well. And so this is just to kind of talk about whatever is on your mind. Um, it's kind of like a free form um, kind of group to just share, you know, your experiences and your feelings. Um, a couple other ones are Pathways, which is a drop-in center just outside of downtown Orlando for individuals with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, and other brain disorders. They offer essential life services, like food service, you can go there and you can just get something to eat. This is all free. Um, you can take a shower. There's phone and computer access, laundry access, and just a place to relax and socialize. There's also Zebra Coalition, which is for, um, it's an organization that supports LGBTQ youth so youth is defined as ages 13 to 24, and they provide individual family counseling, um, social groups, and educational funding support. Uh, then the center as well, um, also known as the LGBTQ Center, um, provides HIV 
hepatitis and STI testing. They provide um, PrEP uh, resources, which is the HIV medication. They provide career planning, mental health counseling, and support groups for different populations. That's so amazing. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. There's so many. I think the main point of that is to really highlight that those who might be feeling hopeless or feel as though there's not help out there, I think the most important thing is there definitely is, there's definitely a lot of resources out there, way more than I'm sure that you listed, Mary. And of course, the Victim Service Center is one of those resources for those who have experienced trauma, of course. And organizations like the Mental Health Association can help you, as well as 211 can help connect you with those. So that's Mm -hmm. wonderful to hear, despite the barriers that there's a lot out there to waiting to support. That being said, I'm really curious to ask this question about how has your work, and feel free to jump in at any time, Faith, as well, how has your work at the Mental Health Association impacted the way that you view mental health? So for me, working at the Mental Health Association, I started out as an intern um, with the Connections Program, and I knew I wanted to work in the mental health field. I've known since I was like 10 years old, I wanted to be a um, psychologist or therapist, and um, I think for me, it was being impacted tremendously in terms of becoming aware of how like difficult the barriers truly are that people face when it comes to receiving mental health assistance, whether it's financial, um, again, not speaking for any group, but if it's cultural, um, all those kind of aspects. And again, the stigmas that exist. For me, it's furthered my belief that empathy is essential when working in the mental health field, as well as in everyday life. I don't think that Um, I think it's really hard to help somebody if you don't have empathy, because you need to understand that you can't understand what this person is going through. You can try to put yourself in their shoes. You can understand that there's an intense and incredible amount of gravity on this person's life, but you have to also respect that you don't truly understand that. You can only really try to understand it. Um, And then that, therefore, has increased my drive and passion to be a good therapist. I've heard a lot of clients tell me on the phone they had a bad experience with mental health. I've heard friends Mm -hmm. tell me they've had a bad experience with mental health because they didn't have a good therapist. Um, And therefore, they are reluctant to get help in the future. So for me, my goal is to be one of the good therapists who either can help give someone a good experience or help someone who's had a bad experience previously shift their feelings about um, receiving therapy in that regard. Um, and also I'd like to give, uh, it's furthered my drive to want to give assistance to those who may ordinarily not be able to access it, um, whether it's through that financial barrier or more. And that's something that I'm taking in with me into my grad school years and coming out of that, um, this experience has, and I'm so grateful to continue working with the program. Um, but these experiences have just helped, I think, mold the kind of person that I want to be, um, when I'm actually a working clinician in the field. And I want to add on to that just by saying before working at Mental Health Association, I knew on paper, um, you know, from school that one in four adults would meet the qualifications to be diagnosed with a mental health condition at some point in their life. But from doing my work at MHA, it's really shown me that everyone knows someone who is living with or has lived with. Um, a mental health condition. Just everyone has a story and everyone is deserving of help. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your background as it pertains to how you view mental health. And the last thing that you mentioned, Mary, about how everyone's met and, and gone through their own stories, that beautifully leads into my la- my one of my couple last questions here, which is, what would you say to someone who is not sure how to support a loved one who is suffering from mental illness? I think um, the biggest thing when you're, you know, when someone comes to you or, you know, in our field, um, you get a call from a family member and they're not sure what to do or they're just trying to find help for that person. I think the biggest thing that you can do for someone in your life who's struggling with a mental illness or you think is struggling is to remind that person or emphasize that they are loved and accepted and that you're there for them. Um, They might not want your help. They might push you away, but I believe that it does make a difference to tell them or show them that you're there for them. It's also important though, to not see it as your job to fix things for this person or fix the situation. They don't, you know, this person doesn't need to be fixed. You want to help the situation. 
Um, but acknowledging that that's, that's not your, your job as much as you want to do that. Um, I think that there are, the biggest thing for you is to give support to that person. And then adding to that, um, one thing that I often say to people is like, it's okay to acknowledge that this is tough on you as well. Um, people often, you know, recognize, um, that it can be hard on the person who is caring for that person with a mental illness, um, or loving that person with a mental illness. It's, it's hard on you because, you love that person and you see them going through a hard time, whatever that might be. Um, and you want to be there for them. And so I often tell people at that point, you know, it's okay. And you might even consider looking for someone to talk to yourself, whether it's a support group. NAMI has an excellent support group, um, for family members or loved ones of someone who has a mental illness. Um, because you can come together with that same group of people, um, or with a group of people that have a similar experience to you, you're all there because you love the person that is struggling. Um, and then it, uh, my last point I would say is um, practice empathy. You know, um, don't try to tell the person to get over it. Or um, my least favorite is others have it worse than you. Um, because what you're doing in that moment is invalidating that person. What they need at this point in their life from you is love and validation and how they feel, regardless of their behaviors, their actions, um, what they might have done, they still have a right, as do you and I, um, to feel whatever and however they feel. Um, and that, I think, is like the most important thing that you can remember when, you know, loving someone who is living with um, a mental illness. Absolutely. Is there anything else you'd like to bring up, Mary? Going off a bit of what um, Faith said, um, is that, yeah, it can seem really overwhelming when someone you love is living with a mental health condition. But um, some insight that I've personally found to be helpful is that um, it can take weight off your shoulders to know that it's not your responsibility to fix them. And that a lot of times that people don't really want you to or expect you to, most of the time, People just want someone to support them and to hold their hand while they're figuring out like some really hard and heavy things. Um, and my other advice is that if you would, if you really do, if you want to help further than that, is that you can do research about your loved one's condition, um, kind of working to try and see what they're going through. Some of the things that they're maybe experiencing can probably let them know how much that you care, how much you care and that you're invested in their well-being. Wonderful. Thank you so much for breaking that down. I definitely mm -hmm. agree. I think it comes almost as if someone came to you and disclosed that they were a survivor of sexual violence. You know, being there and validating their experience. Also, it's important to not speak for them, not saying, you know, this is this is what you need to get help. This is how to do it. But being able to be that person, as you mentioned, Mary, of holding their hand and saying, hey, I did some research. I reached out to the Mental Health Association and I found that there's these resources if you want to take a look or just being that support person for them. And then also knowing that, yes, it, it's also going to affect you. So if you need some support as well, please don't hesitate to reach out to. And yeah, just being there. Be, continuing to be that person in their life, whether that's a friend, whether that's a, a parent, that kind of thing. So yeah, great points. Thank you so much. And that kind of leads to my, my last question here uh, before we sign off, which is, is there anything you would like those who are working on their mental health to know as they move towards healing? And do you think everyone should focus on their mental health and healing? For me, I one of my biggest beliefs, and I'm up here as well with mental health experiences, and I often have to tell myself this, um, it's understanding and acknowledging that like this isn't a race. There are, and there definitely will be days where it isn't easy for you, um, and you might feel like your mental health, your mental illness is consuming you, or your struggles are consuming you, um, but understanding that, that that doesn't make you a failure. That doesn't mean that you, um, you're the worst, or that you're, you know, you, you're going backwards, or anything like that. Everybody has bad days. Um, you too are entitled to have those bad days as well. Um, for me, another one that I like to remember is um, you're still here after everything you've been through. 
um, regardless of how you feel you've handled it, that does show that you are strong. The fact that you're still here. Um, you're here, you're living, you're breathing. You are a strong person. Um, and also trying to remember to surround yourself with the people that love you. If um, understanding that or trying to understand that they may not always say the right thing or do the best thing, um, trying to keep in mind that they do love you. And if you need to give yourself some separation from them, that's okay. You need to do what you need to do for your mental health. And above all, I think it's loving yourself, being kind to yourself. Um, if you're struggling, you know, do your favorite things. Remember to take it one step, one day at a time, if that's what you need to do for yourself. And I think, um, you know, Mary made a great point earlier talking about rap training and things like that. Um, those kind of workshops, looking into those things, having a safety plan, um, those make a difference for you as well. So it's really monitoring yourself and monitoring what you need. And if you do need something like not beating yourself up about that, it's okay to need a little bit of help. And I think everybody could benefit. Um, I always say this, everybody could benefit from therapy. Everybody could benefit to talking to someone and opening yourselves up to that vulnerability. You know, whether you're struggling with a mental health um, illness or struggles or not, it opens you up to this beautiful, amazing opportunity to learn about ourselves and work to be the best version of ourselves that we can be both for the people we love. And more importantly, I think for ourselves. Wonderfully put Mary, is there anything else you'd like to add to that? Yeah. Um, I would love to say that absolutely everyone deserves to prioritize their mental health and their healing and that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can change that. Um, the mental health association of central Florida's slogan is it's okay to get help. And that couldn't be more true, whether it's through counseling, peer support, support groups, or any other healing outlet, you're worthy of getting help. And I'm not sure what's best for everyone to know, but I do know from personal experience that I have found it helpful to know that it sounds cliche, but it does get better. Whatever you're going through, it, better days are going to be there. That's always important to highlight. And I think that's a beautiful place to kind of sign off. But before I do, is there anything else that you, Mary, or you, Faith, you'd like to share with the audience? Yeah. Um, if, if you or a loved one are in need of a mental health resource, you can contact us by calling us at 407-898-0110. Or you can go online anytime at mhacf.org slash the word mental dash health dash connections to fill out a referral and our connection specialist will start working on your referral ASAP and we'll try and get you the best possible resources that fit your unique needs. They're usually um, sent back in a few business days and um, no insurance is required. It's a free service. So, yeah. Wonderful. Faith, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I just want, I want to say, Mary, thank you for mentioning, you know, our program um, because we are here to help. And I love that we can, you know, be here on platforms along with other organizations and talk about each of our groups, um, each of our missions and understanding that we're all kind of here we're all here in this together. Um, we're all here to help everybody in whatever aspect, whatever capacity they may need. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to you, Emily, for having us both on the show. It's both an honor and a pleasure to get to be here to share, you know, what I do know about mental health from my own peer perspective, same for Mary, her own perspective and experiences. Um, and also from the perspective of people who do have, you know, um, the area of experience that we have in the field. Um, so thank you so much for having us here. Um, Mary, thanks for coming on with me. Of course. I loved it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for also both of you being here. It's been a wonderful conversation and it's always important to remind everyone that we're kind of a network here in central Florida. We're here to help each other and support each other. And so I think that's a wonderful place to sign off. So thank you to the listener for listening to the victim service podcast. The Victim Service Center is a nonprofit organization that provides free confidential counseling services for victims of any kind of trauma in Central Florida. To learn more about our services, please visit victimservicecenter.org. And to everyone listening, healing is not linear and you are not alone. And thank you once again, Faith and Mary, for joining me today. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.